So if you have any questions about any kind of thing, now is the time. And while you guys are asking questions, I'm going to do a painting. Uh, yeah, I got a, a question. This is more Except like... Except for Rick. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm I'm, well, I'm in my spaceship, so I'm jetting out of here, dude. You know? Get out of here. Yeah, jetting out of here, spaceship. dude. Uh, so this is more like... Like, it goes into, you know, how there's, like, certain time limits and expectations. I'm speaking more from, like, an industry standpoint, right? Like, sure. and it varies from person to person. But, like, if I'm setting up a project for myself and it's not something that, you know, like, an instructor, like, you would say, oh, yeah, spend, like, an hour on each one of these thumbnails or whatever. Sure. Like, how do you gauge, like the amount of time to spend per something because that's something where I really fall into a pitfall and then I'm just like oh, I'll spend a little bit more time on it especially with personal work well you know I I uh do something very specialized that I know a lot of other instructors do not do uh-huh uh, which is tell people to use an actual timer right and to be more free and the timer serves multiple purposes the timer is original purpose which is great is to help you kind of manage your time right but the indirect result of that managing of time is that you start to know how long it takes you to do stuff do you get it yeah like if you're timing yourself to do an hour long painting right and you start to do that for years or even months right you just start to know i can do something in about this long right like i gave myself about 15 minutes I know by the end of this 15 minutes, I, I'm going to have a decent painting of like some sort of cool robot character, right? I just know I will. There's like no doubt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I've just been doing this for so long and I've been timing myself for so long. That's just how it is. And what's powerful about this is that let's say I get hired to work on like a project to make more robots for them, right? <clears throat> I just know that it's going to take me an hour. I'm going to be like, hey, okay, it's going to take me an hour. And they're like, hey, can you give us like uh, a page of variations? And I was like, yeah, I can get you about like five or six, you know? Mm -hmm. And be like, okay, five or six like thumbnails, iteration style stuff, like very like quick and dirty. I could probably do five or six because I could do about 15 minutes, you know, worth each design, probably in an hour and a half. Okay. Let me schedule an hour and a half of my day <laughs> to do those things. And then I'll do it during that time and then send it to them confidently within that time frame. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you're not timing yourself and you're not auditing how long it takes you to do something of any kind, right? And you should specialize what takes you longer. Like, okay, if I'm doing a 3D prop, right? Like if I'm modeling it in 3D, like designing it in 3D, like what does that mean? How long does that take, right? Yeah. Uh, versus like painting it versus doing thumbnails. Like if you're not auditing any and all of these things, then yeah, you're going to always be guessing, right? Because you just weren't sure. Sometimes it took you five hours. Sometimes it took you six hours. Sometimes it took you one hour, right? And that's why whenever you have to give an estimate to somebody else, you're just kind of like, yeah, I can get that by tomorrow. And then like, it's the, like, let's say 3D modeling uh, you didn't know this, but like it takes you about like four hours to do just one model. But you don't know this on the top of your head. It just does. And so you thought, because one time you were able to do it in two hours, that mm -hmm. one time. So in your mind, you're thinking, yeah, I can probably get three or four in the day. Right. And I told them I'm going to do three or four. And then, but like I said, your actual average is four hours. You do one after four hours and you're like, oh my gosh, like I only got yeah. one done. And I said I was gonna get four of them. Shit, that's like I gotta stay up all night, and like, and you might end up staying up all night because of that, right? But if you knew it took you four hours, you can be like, I can get you three to four in two days, and that would be realistic, and that would be okay. They would be okay with that because you told them that's not. It's that like false expectation. This is why the creative industry, like projects like CG Project Red. Uh, cyberpunk mm -hmm. and you know last of us or any game that pretty much 
every game that pretty much goes into crunch, this is not just a result of bad management. Absolutely, there's a bad management problem there, right? But also, artists don't know what the fuck they're talking about, too. They don't know how long it takes to do stuff. Like, this is not unique to you. Like, this is, like, common in the industry in general. Okay. Like, most artists have a hard time other than, like, the higher echelon of uh, concept artists, right? Uh, have a hard time gauging how long it takes them to do something. Okay? I know this because I've been dealing with this my whole career. Uh, and what I mean by dealing with this is dealing with people complaining about upper management when I'm like, well, you shouldn't have told them that you can do that that quickly. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's funny because when I was art directing on a project, man, we used something called a JIRA. I'm not sure if you know what JIRA is. Uh, it's basically a task manager. Like you just say, hey, like I'm going to do Slack these. kind of or? No, Slack is more of like a communication. Oh tool right it's like a messenger and you can you can track stuff there too absolutely but trello like, is it like trello trello is much better example yes. okay or just any kind of like to-do list just like yeah. glorify to do list that everybody can look at and see what your to-do list is <laughs> you know what i mean so uh what would happen is people would be like hey how long will it take you to do a page of concepts and people go, like, I don't know, like uh, maybe two days, <laughs> right? And then they ne actually needed four days, right? Because mm -hmm. because maybe it does technically take them two days, but they forgot they had to do this other thing. And someone asked them to do this one thing and then their meetings. And now those two days of work just evaporated, right? For all sort of indirect reasons, which is part of the man management problem. But the problem is, is that management isn't fully responsible because if you're not tracking all these little side quests you know like you personally the artist then management doesn't know that you had like seven different side quests uh along with your main tasks right yes and, and, and then what ends up happening is that they just think that you're underperforming right when in reality you weren't auditing yourself effectively and communicating that right and management wasn't doing a good job by have, reminding you to audit all of your side quests so that they can budget the next milestone more effectively, right? And have better expectations. But that's also, that's why I'm saying like, that's your responsibility. You should be able to know how long it takes you to do stuff, like truly. And then when things start to kind of fall off the bandwagon, you can be like reliably think, oh, there must be something else happening. Oh, I'm taking all these side quests. Oh, these meetings are like uh, time sync oh like you know this like happened mm -hmm. and then you could be like some of these things are so, like user error other things were outside of my control right and okay. just communicate that to the proper people you know what i mean the user error stuff obviously that's your own fault you need to work on that right yeah. like if you thought it took you two hours but it actually took you seven hours that's user error right but like meetings on top of meetings on top of meetings you're like, well, that's important. I need to go to a lot of these meetings. So I need to like next time when I say I can do it in a week or sorry, two days, I should say it, it'll take a week because I'm including meetings. Uh, when I do my own schedule, one thing that I've done is I literally give myself a whole week off where I'm not doing anything. Like a year or? A no, no, I'm talking week. about like on a milestone. Oh. Right, like I know I could do all the things I'm saying. But I also know that there's like literally going to be things people are asking me during the process. Yeah. And I actually encourage all of my coworkers to do the same thing. Like, like literally plan like at least three days where you're literally doing nothing, like a three day buffer. Cause you are always going to be asked to do something always that you did not anticipate. And every milestone that's happened that when I worked on the project and the projects where I'm lead, uh, I'm pretty good about this specific part of management. And wouldn't you know it, our expectations are always met every milestone and people aren't working overtime. Mm -hmm. Because I'm telling people to fucking tell me their side quests. <laughs> and they get real uh, they get real sad because, oh, I didn't, like, I'm sorry, I didn't get this and that. And I'm like, it's okay. Now we know. Just write down all of the things that you did this milestone so we can take a look at it and back 
in the in the backlog and kind of backtrack you know yeah it's okay we didn't know that it was going to be this long but now we do so let's try not to make the same mistake again right and you should do that to yourself you shouldn't just uh it's just like most things right you shouldn't just kind of shift the blame haphazardly you should try to find as much of your own personal responsibility to your own time management so that way you can rule it out if you don't have any control of your own time management then uh then yes that's like a big variable that could be contributing to your false expectations of work and deliverables right okay and i would not rule that out just yet or i wouldn't point fingers just yet until i knew that was ruled out like i know i can paint something within 15 minutes like it's i still have four minutes left and look how far i've gotten with this one painting yeah like i just knew i I even i didn't even know what i was going to paint as a fucking let's do a robot (laughs) and i know i was going to paint well so well that i didn't even think about it right i was talking to you this whole time right yeah and you only get that way from like doing it over and over again same with the timer like knowing how long you're gonna (laughs) i'm literally timing myself and I check in every three minutes and then I adjust. I'm like, oh, I didn't do the body yet. Let me go do the body. Oh, I haven't done the values uh, aggressively enough. You know? Yeah. This is why when I went to Japan, I won that speed painting contest, man. Like that I is know true. How, I know what five minutes feels like. And some people do not know what five minutes feels like. Yeah, I can I intuitively feel five minutes because I've timed myself so much. I remember when you were training yourself, dude, like we would go sketch or whatever, and you'd just be like, nope, got it set five minutes or whatever. And I'm like, what are you doing? You know what I was, you know what I was doing the, the day of the contest? Because I knew that there was, uh, I think, a hundred combinations. Uh huh. So I tried to draw every combination. Oh my gosh. So that I would have it in my mind before. And I got to 56. I only got halfway there. Wow. And, uh, out of the four (laughs) out of the four things i think i got only one of them was the one that was i actually did a thumbnail for (laughs) so all of them were improvised on the spot i remember the moment (laughs) yeah but i but i do i do remember thinking to myself i was like i got fucking two hours i could do like one minute sketches I, i remember i was like doing the math i was like i can do one minute sketches and then I can get them all, <laughs> right? And um, people uh, kept on talking to me and like I had to keep going to these interviews and like all the stuff. So I didn't budget that. I didn't know that that was gonna be a thing, you know? Yeah. So, but now I know. So the next time if they say 300 combinations, I'm gonna try to do 300 illustrations because I'm competitive. And that's what a pro athlete would do, right? Mm-hmm the edge but anyway gonna move on we got about i'm gonna give myself six more minutes i said about 20 minutes total any other questions what's the sweet spot like when you're say you're doing a piece of concept art and you know it needs to go to the 3d team like what's the sweet spot you try to aim for that you give them enough information without them going what's their materials made out of and what's just on the back well i mean the an- the answer to your question was within the question, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is if they have to like come to you and say, what's in the back? Like, what kind of material is this? Mm-hmm. Um, then that's, you didn't go far enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Take a look at this concept, right? Like to me, a lot of this is already pretty good <clears throat> for a 3D modeler, mm-hmm. right? Like this is still definitely rough and tough in cer- certain spots, but there's enough information here you know, for a modeler to get going. And I know this to be true because I have had half sketches like this been modeled, mm-hmm. right? Plenty of times. Um, and so to me, when I started learning modeling uh, very early in my career, uh, it was because I would go talk to the modelers all the time and they were telling me what I was missing in my concepts all the time. And uh, I am a big believer of doing things that are useful, right? Like that's my job is to be useful 
on the visual side. So I really made it a goal to be useful in my uh, in my endeavors, right? Mm-hmm. And so if I am doing a concept and my concept is unclear, right, to a 3D modeler, then I kind of defeated the point uh, of, or not entirely, but like part of my job description has kind of been ignored, right? Like I'm supposed to be a concept artist is basically to inspire the idea visually that's all part of the deal right so you could totally have the wishy-washy kind of concepts absolutely right Mm -hmm. but once you get there like that's like just for like writers and directors right to be pumped but then it has to go to a modeling team and then the modeling team has to create it and then animators have to animate it and you know post-process people have to fix everything that everyone broke right and i just it just made me realize it's like i feel like if I'm just giving them haphazard concepts. I'm kind of like selling a pipe dream, right? Mm. And I was like, I don't like that. I want to sell the dream, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like something that actually can be made, not something that wouldn't it be cool if that was made, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, That's why like when we see movies like uh, the Spider-Verse film, like that's a movie, that's a great example of like concept to film. And when that happens, it's amazing, right? Mm-hmm. But then when you look at like concepts versus like the final result and you're just like, what happened? It's like, well, they didn't know how to do it. That's what happened, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. It was not so much that they didn't want to do it. The director was like probably super pumped. The modelers were probably super pumped. Everyone was like, oh, amazing. And a concept artist is like, I know, I'm one of the greatest. <laughs> um, but then they try to actually execute and realize, oh no, you're one of the greatest. How can we emulate that? Oh shit, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I've I've learned that that's not acceptable. You know, it's like selling the wrong vision. Now, if we're mm-hmm. doing like an illustration, right? Then that's the that is the final product. You know, the final product is the concept because that's the illustration. So, like card games and such do really great because mm-hmm. they they literally just package the concept art, right? So that's yeah. the that's sweet spot. The sweet spot is to deliver something that's actually like tangible. Mm-hmm. And and don't confuse that with like super realistic. Okay. I'm not trying to say like, oh, your thing should be fully rendered or anything like that. If your thing's supposed to be stylized, like in a stylized game, then design your concepts to look like they fit in a stylized game. Like something that people can hand texture, people that can model on your team. And they can look good at the same time, you know? Mm-hmm. Nothing that like only you could hand paint <laughs> and then <laughs> nobody else can. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that always sounds like a breakdown in communication when things fall apart yeah, from constant. That's even better team. way of thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like you're just one part of the baton to be communicated, mm-hmm. right? And if the baton you've created, you've like sculpted out of like 40 pounds of steel <laughs> and you're the only person that can carry that, and people are like, all right, well, how do we, uh, I mean, nobody here can carry 40 pounds of steel. Uh, we'll just shave some like corners off and we'll just make it like a 20 pound paperweight, you know? <laughs> I think it's strong and, enough to beat you with it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like, it's, yep. that's, that's my advice to you when it comes to that stuff. Cool. You know, like know who you're working with, like the people and their, their skill level mm-hmm. and try to like, like, work within those means and be very, very receptive to their uh, growing pains. Because if you feel like students have a hard time kind of hearing good advice, just because, you know, usually students are a little bit more defensive and a little bit more um, standoffish, especially Mm -hmm. when they go to like random people and ask for advice. Usually in these settings that it doesn't happen because you guys are, you guys want me to to give you advice. So you're very receptive. But if you go to a convention, sometimes people get a little more defensive. I know I have. Uh, it's actually more so true in a professional setting. Mm. It's crazy. Like, yeah, I try to give some uh, helping advice and people get like, really like, like, don't tell me how to do my job. But, like, that's kind of <laughs> how they, their, their vibes are. Mm. And I'm just like, it's wrong though. <laughs> and I'm actually way more, uh, I'm way less friendly uh, because <laughs> In a student-teacher environment, 
the the difference is because the relationship is different because i'm here to help you guys i'm here to teach you you guys are allowed to fail you guys are allowed to make mistakes this is a place that's safe right mm -hmm. but in a job um we can all lose our jobs if you fuck up yep. and this i've happened i've happened to see it many many times and this being nice to people because you don't want to hurt their feelings is ultimately a bad strategy because if the project is garbage because everyone but everyone feels great about working with each other but the project is literally shit and it doesn't sell well and nobody buys your game and nobody wants to play it then the whole company shuts down and oh. nobody's gonna be happy right mm -hmm. so you gotta you gotta be a little bit more true grit when it comes to uh the work environment in fact i always yep. encourage my students once you go into a job like what do you, what, what is there to expect you know you should expect to do exactly what they want you to do so if you are doing illustrations right and they hired you because of the illustrations that you uh, showed them they loved then you have to replicate that consistently and constantly right it's like um uh, in the most simplest terms, like if you were working at a fast food chain and I ordered like a cheeseburger from you and you're like, yeah, okay. And you go back and you're just like, yeah, I'm making a chicken sandwich. And so I don't really know how to make a cheeseburger. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be like, Hey, I ordered a fucking cheeseburger. And you're like, yeah, but you know, like chicken sandwiches are good too. And I was like, yeah, okay. Well, I don't want a chicken sandwich. I want a cheeseburger. You're like, yeah, all right, let me try again. And you go back and make me a salad. And they're not even a good salad. You like throw like <laughs> just like oil and grease on it and like put like some ice cream on top of it. And like, Here's what's what left in the in the <laughs> toppings book in here. And I just scrape that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, Ugh, what? Where's my cheeseburger? Right. Like it, as a consumer, right, as a customer, many of you guys would be really pissed off if the the place you went to would just, just kept on messing up your order or it would not give you your order, right? That dynamic is not any different uh, at the larger scale of like uh, a video game studio trying to deliver to gamers, okay? And and I think artists and creatives forget that, and they let they tend to get their egos get in the way of like no 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 I gotta advance I gotta remember what people actually want to play. Uh, when I look at companies like Insomniac Games, I think they get it. They know what they're their gamers, their their users, their players want to play, so they make those games and people play them. They love them, you know. So I like love indie games too because they have that same vibe. They make games for people that want to play indie games, you know. Mm -hmm. Like Call of Duty is a great example. Like Call of Duty knows what they're doing. They fucking yep. know what the hell they're doing. They're like, people love these games. We're gonna keep making them, and we're gonna make them better uh, incrementally every time. And yeah. as much as they might not be like, like I remember when I heard uh, they were going to make their own battle royale, I was like, it's going to just destroy everything, everything else when it comes out. Like nothing's going to stand a chance. And people were like, oh, whatever it does, Call of Duty. I was like, no, you know, you guys have no idea. <laughs> the, 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 the developers of Call of Duty know how to make a first person shooter game. They've done it so long. This is like their thing, you know? And you might not like the process of making that kind of game because it's super stale. It's not that innovative, but they fucking know what they're doing, dude. And sure enough, it came out. I think what was it, Warzone? Yeah. Yeah. And people yeah. loved it. And then I remember when I heard. I haven't played it, um, but I remember when people were telling me about Gulag, when you die, you can. Yeah. Die oh, and yeah. That was like, that was the thing there. I was like. Pfft. That's because they know how to make fun games. They're like, this is stupid. Like, you just completely punish players for being bad. No, no, no. Let's <laughs> give them a chance. <laughs> right. And I was like, yeah, dude, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, that's like way too terrible of a punishment. You know, the idea was great. It's really great. But like, it's just real, real turnoff, you know? Um, Epic, I think, is starting to get there. Like, I saw what they did with Fortnite. They had like concerts in their games. I'm like, this is so cool. Like, they get it. Yep. Um, but some, like I said, some creators forget and they get really stuck in their ego and they want to like always challenge the mold or they don't want to challenge at all. It's like no in between and it's like really rough. So you don't want to be that. You want to be somebody who can communicate well, who can see the bigger vision, 
who's ready to make changes in their abilities, uh, who can recognize that if they're lacking abilities, they, need, they do need to make up for that. Uh, otherwise, you're really an anchor bringing down the ship, you know? And you don't want to Collaboration. Be yeah, collaboration. Yeah, I think the communication is a, a big part because going back oh, to absolutely. another parallel for mine is that being a developer, I'm also having to work with designers when they're building the website or the application yeah. or whatever, the interface. And I've worked with designers who are just like, this is what I want, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, I, <laughs> that, that's just not really feasible in this sense. Like, sure. or then there's people, but then like at my last job, I worked with several people who were just very, we, we, we all found this way of communicating and understanding, okay, let's go back and forth and figure out, okay, this is what I was thinking. Is that feasible? And how, how well can you do that? Whatever. And so just understanding what the other people can do. And when you don't understand it, ask. People don't like to ask. Yeah. They just want to like live in their corner and then wait at the last minute. <laughs> you mean you <laughs> don't <true>. know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's like I was saying earlier about like the COVID response. Like people just weren't cool with not knowing, you know? And um, I think our culture in general has really perpetuated this idea that if you don't know, then you're a, you're a fucking moron, right? Like if you think about like our uh, educational system, you know, if you, if you don't pass a test, you fail. And then you have to either uh, stay behind or move into the next period uh, next series of classes by faking it so you don't look like an idiot because you had to be held behind you know mm. but you're not ready you 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 cheated on your algebra test so you don't deserve to be in algebra two but then now you cheat in algebra two so you don't deserve to be in calculus if you even get that far right and people do this too much and they've perpetuated this mentality and so when people say oh you don't know your algebra and they feel like it's a personal attack, but it's like, yeah, you don't know your algebra because you cheated and that's okay. <laughs> you know, like it's okay that you don't know your algebra. It's not your fault that the system is built to not wait for you. It's built to push you through, right? And it's so like a lot they'll... of people have this ideas uh, in the professional world. And this is why, especially in, in the creative fields, you see a lot of crunch, you see a lot of mismanagement because it not only is it hard to manage people's egos and more conventional careers it's even harder in the creative careers it just is We're, i heard somebody's gonna say something i have a question if that's okay yeah you'll you'll have the last question and then we're gonna go all right we'll a couple minutes created. Um, i wonder because i know you do some 3d and other use all kind of materials and i'm kind of like the same way i as you know i do like illustration 2d 3d i and VR on top of that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm at this point that I'm trying to figure out how to just combine everything that I know toward the main purpose of my work, especially when it comes to working with clients, because, you know, I love doing 2D work, for example, but I can yeah. also achieve, especially when it comes to hard surface, I can achieve 3D with 3D quicker results, you know. Yeah. So I don't know how, how you combine how much of how you pick how much of what you know to put it in there. Yeah, and so uh, the 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 answer to your question is still the same answer I've been giving you, which is I just stay focused. So uh, I just stayed focused on two D for like a long time, uh, and then I would do three D. I would learn three D and photo bashing and all these other things. But not as like, oh, this is now my new way of doing it. It was like, no, I'm going to learn it because I should. And I'm going to apply it to my main discipline, which is character or character concepting, right? So maybe I'll make something in 3D. But because it's like not as good as my 2D, it didn't matter. I'll just bring it into 2D and then paint over it. Does it make sense? Yeah. And then I, I did that for so many years that my 3D skills are now really good. I'm like a really good 3D artist, but it wasn't like I did it all at once, all the time, all together. It was like there was one main focus and then these side focuses that came along. And then once my main focus became my mastery, like maybe like seven years in my career, 
then I was I didn't feel as bad about like staying in 3D for longer to really get good at 3D. Does it make sense? Yeah. Because if someone hired me to be a concept artist, I can do it all in 2D. I don't have to touch 3D at all, ever, right? And if I do use 3D, it's because there's a good reason for it. Like maybe I need to get the perspective right, understand the scale, you know? But not because I'm like, I'm gonna do 3D and mixer. Like, it was more like, I already know, like I have a fail safe. No matter what happens here, there, I have a process that will not let me down. You know what I mean? And uh, I remember I was working on a project where I was like, I'm gonna try to do some VR concepts. And I did, I did some VR concepts, but ultimately I just went straight back to 2D because of the pace of the project, you know? But I was like, I'm gonna do some VR stuff. And they liked it too. They're like, oh, this is super cool. But then they're like, all right, but can you do some more of these? And I was like, yeah, okay. I was like, I'm just gonna give you guys some rough sketches because it'll be just be faster. You know, but at least these VR concepts kind of set the stage, but I'm not gonna probably touch VR anymore because there's just no time, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's how I still feel, right? And so like now I've been messing with 3D like a lot, like I'm pretty competent 3D artist. And like I said, I, I started exploring um, this stuff I want to show you. I shared it. Like, see this right here? So these are these are 3D. Okay. So let me see if I can pull up the actual model. Oh, so did you do this all in Blender? I hand painted those textures in uh, Procreate because I was watching a movie with my wife. And I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try something. I'm going to paint the texture first. So this is all painted in Procreate. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that is a great idea. <laughs> and then I was like, and then I'm going to iterate based off of that one texture sheet. I'm not oh, gonna yeah, do... so these on Facebook. Yeah, it's even wild. this background is from the same texture. I think it's like right here, this little corner. <laughs> OK. Or maybe it's over here. I forget exactly. 10,000 tries. That's really good. Can you zoom in on them a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah. well, I think famous. what he means is, can we see the wireframe? Yeah, yeah. Can we see the wireframe? <laughs> yeah. I'm really curious. Uh, about. Oh, no, yeah, it's okay. just just low poly. Mm-hmm. That is cool. You, that you, modeled, a, you That's some low poly right there. I, that is so good. <laughs> but it's cool, right? It's like... Uh, a combination of my my excellent blender skills that I have obtained over the many years. Well, I would say like the last two years. And then just my general 3D skills. I just Did had to learn s- Blender. And then uh, something that I'm already pretty great at, which is painting, right? Like this took me like 24 minutes, maybe less, maybe more. Let's just say 30 minutes. Uh, and then this scene probably took me about an hour to two hours total. So two and a half hours total. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a great way to do iterations because it's like three dimensional iterations, you know? Yeah. It's nice. And you, you use the fabric texture a couple times on, a, oh, dude. on the sleeves. It's because, nice. because I know how design works and I'm like, mm-hmm. most of the time designs are repeated. So mm-hmm. I can just keep repeating the idea. This yeah. one's asymmetrical. This one's like, he's got like some sort of skeletal wing, but it's like easy, man. Like I can just yeah. be like, yeah, let's just do some fancy stuff, bro. <laughs> let's just get in here and like, let's like get weird. Oh, that's cool. Cause you have all the UVs and everything worked out. So you don't really have to mess with anything. You're like, ah, shit, I this. that's Dude. awesome. You know nice. what's up. This is not a unique process, by the way. Nice. This is something that um, uh, environment artists use all the time because environment mm-hmm. artists have the unwieldy responsibility of making an environment that's also optimal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Yeah, Character they're... artists, on the other hand, they're a bunch of motherfuckers, dude. <laughs> they're like, we're going to use all the polygons <laughs> and all the texture resolution and it's probably not going to even be seen. Like I had friends who were telling me, like, "Oh, dude, these fucking character modelers, like one of their guns has like, um, uh, like 4K resolutions on like the 
the scope of their gun. And I'm like, oh man. Oh. Give me all those textures that went on my guns. Look at that. New variation, dude. Tight. So did you sculpt those guys out to start with? Or like did you no. just model them from a like anybody who can do that blows me away because like I just sculpt in ZBrush and like that's I'm... all I know. <laughs> yeah, I know I know that's a normal process. Most people do that. Uh, I don't do that because it's slower. Because like to me, it's the same reason why I don't do line art uh, that often, because line art basically is the precursor to the the value breakout, which is then the precursor to the lighting, which is then the precursor to the, like the final rendering. I'm just like, just get to the final rendering. Yeah. And it's like, well, how? How can you see the future? It's like, well, you can't. You got to practice so you know the future so like for me i was like okay when i made this texture I was like, all right here we go here's what we're gonna do blue blue and orange complementary got it i was like okay i can probably make armor pieces just from this just from just from this little thing here so i'm gonna make that higher res than everything else this actually could be higher as i up it so it just that's photoshop's rasterizing but this was a test anyway so i wasn't too worried about it I was like, you know, this could have been higher res too. I was like, you know what? Maybe I can go 4K because I think this is 1K. So maybe I should mm. stay, start with 4K. That's my next experiment. So everything on this one texture is super high res, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so I can recycle as much as possible. And then just build around that. Just build one thing at a time, you know? Just build one thing at a time. And there's like stretching and stuff like this, but I'm doing this for concept reasons for now. And it goes back to that idea of communication. I hand, I hand this off to a modeler. They're like, "Guy, got it," and then they can do all their bullshit of like sculpting it. <laughs> all that stuff. Marvelous me. designer bullshit. Yeah, yeah. What? All this, all this bullshit. All that goddamn shit that we gotta learn. Yeah, marvelous designer is a great example of mm. like supplementing people's uh, lack of understanding of folds and materials. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's a great tool, but you got to understand what it's doing. You know, <laughs> it's 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 basically supplementing your your lack of understanding. And if you understand that, it'll be a better tool. It'll be a better tool because then mm -hmm. you can learn what you should need, what you need to learn, and then use the tool even more effectively. Yeah. Right. So, like, what in? Oh, gone. I always say, if you like don't know, is... hold on, just a second. I always say, if you don't know how to build a table, it doesn't matter if you use a screwdriver or a power drill. You're not going to build a table, you know? And so uh, building a table, knowing how to build a table is more important, you know? And then when if you use a power drill, you're going to build a table better and faster. You know what I mean? So isn't there merit in, like, learning the slow way to do it so you know, like, what corners to cut? Like, line art, for example. Like, if you're like, oh, I can do line art really freaking well, like, I know which avenues of line art to like subtract from or... sure so for me line art is another tool yeah like I, I just told you line art is a precursor to all the other stuff so my solution to that was we'll just learn how to do all the stuff it's really hard to do all the stuff so i was like okay so i should just do it remember when i was bringing up that example of like every time you do something that's very challenging you're going past like a hundred thousand people right yeah. So me circ circumventing, like going around line art to go straight to learning how to paint effectively uh, was not like radical, by the way. Like there's lots of people who just go straight to painting, but there's not too many people who do go, go straight to painting and design at the same time. So I was like, okay, that's going to be my main focus. And I did that for like years. I just focused in on that like for years until it became second nature. That's all I'm getting at. But there's nothing wrong with line art. I like, I love line art. Some of my favorite artists do line art. I'm just saying, I know, I know what it is. <laughs> you know, I know what it's doing. It's, it's a crutch if, if I'm not paying attention, you know? And then yeah. people, people then say, oh man, I see what this person did. They painted this thing. I want to now be able to paint from scratch. But they have built their whole philosophy around line art than to values and you know what I mean? Like they built their whole process around a very rigid system, mm. you know? Where I could choose to use line art 
because I think it's going to be better for what I want to show. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I want the presentation to be line art because I think it conveys what needs to be conveyed the best. Right? If I wanted this to be actually lit, you know, this is not the best way to do it. Yeah. Because these are hand painted. But my, my goal was not to do that. I actually, my goal is to do what you saw. Like, I'm trying to yeah see it's like what oh no mm. low poly <laughs> but dude i i still have strats dude because i'm a material whiz as well we'll figure this out <laughs> we'll figure this out but you see my point it's just like you know you want to learn the methodology you don't want to just like just do those stuff because it's easier and if you do decide this, by the way, like I want to do this because I feel more comfortable. Fuck all that noise that AJ's talking about. Then, then just know that's what you agreed to. That's all. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that either. Like I said, my favorite artists are line artists. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of good, like hard surface concept artists who do like specifically line, like Darren Bacon and stuff like that. Like do some awesome. I know they like some of them a lot of them know how to paint too but like yeah. i'm just deciding like why do they choose line art then like you know why not just paint the thing i do know anyway yeah see those normals there's another alternative solution to this mm. uh, alternative solution to this is be to do a better low poly model you said you're doing quick iterations so like the nitty-gritty stuff is like I always know. light it in 2d and just paint over it with multiply layers and stuff like that always relight it with you know don't tell me what to do i was <laughs> i was uh watching uh what is his name carl kapinski and he was talking about that because he primarily does light art but he does do good painting when he wants to but he was talking about like he just enjoys the style of line art more and so and, and that's sure. just where he goes because he just finds that more entertaining and more enjoyable to 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 view and to 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 play with and so it's not that he doesn't that's all he can do or whatever it's just mm -hmm. even though he can paint he just doesn't usually want to yeah that's mm -hmm. what i said like it's up to you man i'm okay with whatever just don't get it twisted that's all i'm saying mm. well, how do you pick that now that you're good at both of them like when it comes time for your client i mean for your own work i understand like your experience with both but now you're both good at 3d and 2d when the client requests something i just do whatever is the best effective thing i don't me? Uh, yeah if, if I think I it's some like of that. Is, if I feel I like this don't... is the best approach, then this is the best approach. If it's not, I don't do it. I think some of that too is just to like know where, know. If someone's like coming to you and saying like, I want this like high poly model, or whatever, blah, 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 blah. So I can put it into this video game, but you're not a 3D modeler. Then you just say, no, that's not my job. I'll create the concept for someone else to create the model for you but i mean you gotta keep within the scope of what you want to do yeah all right i'm gonna end the class because i just realized it's getting late and i <laughs> thought i thought i knew <laughs> we took you down the rabbit hole didn't we you guys asked me questions Come back two good questions and then you guys challenge me here with this <laughs> nonsense so i'm trying to see what i can get i'm getting something I'm not yeah, too... dude, look at that marbly texture yeah i'm not too offended this is not too bad look at that it's that noise. <laughs> save it no <laughs> <laughs> yeah Maybe round two, I'll figure something out. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, see you guys later. Right. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.